Hi, my name is Francis Rocco Prestillo. I play with a group called Tower of Power. In this video, we're going to answer some questions that are frequently asked me about my technique and my approach to the instrument. First, I want to tell you just a little about me. I've been playing with the band for a little over 20 years. Some of my influences uh, go back to uh, the 60s, early 70s like uh, James Brown, Sly Stone, uh, the Memphis sound, the Motown sound, players like James Jamerson, Duck Dunn. Um, I consider myself basically a rhythm section player, not a soloist, although I feel like I'm soloing all the time the way I play, but it's always from inside the groove. Uh, Anybody who may have heard any, uh, any records or seen me play live will notice that uh, I'm a pretty busy player. And I just want to make the point that it's okay to be busy, just as long as you don't step on nobody's toes. And with that, let's tune up and get started. Okay, here's a G. Here's a D. Here's an A. And here's an E. The first thing we're going to look at on this video is the right and left hand technique. We're going to start with the right hand first. Uh, I use two fingers and I use just this part of the fingers. And I personally use uh, hand cream just for sensitivity to the string because I've had problems where my fingers would stick <laughs> uh, to the strings. Uh, I position my hand in the middle of this area. Not back here because there's too much tension, not up here because it's too too much flack. I rest my thumb on the pickup or on the E string for uh, support. And you'll notice I play fairly hard. Um, you'll notice I don't pluck underneath the string and pull it, but I just pluck it firm, alternating 
constantly, uh, almost all the time. If you dampen out the strings with your left hand like this, you create just percussive sound, or what is called ghosting, where the notes are completely dead. As far as my left hand is concerned, probably the most important thing I do is get this muting sound uh, where the notes are, are short and percussive, but you can still hear the tone of the note. And the way I get this is I'll put my second finger down on the note that I want to hear and putting the rest of my fingers down, the third and fourth, this is the sound that you get. Now if I lift the third and fourth, Put it down gradually, you can hear the difference. Um, and that's how I basically get that sound. One more thing that makes that sound happen is just from and that's just with the one finger just lifting up enough and then just hitting it dead. Um, that would be the ghost note which is different than muting, because there's not really any note there. But those are the two things that make this happen. Okay, so at this point we're gonna combine uh, both hands and try this exercise. It takes you from the top to the bottom. And uh, with the right hand, alternating both fingers evenly, consistently across the strings. And the left hand is going to do the muting, but it's important to let the tone of the note still ring through. So it will be like this. And like I said, alternating and making it even and consistent. That's the important thing. Let's try this with 16th notes in the metronome. Just be sure to control the muting with your left hand so the notes don't ring into each other. Let's try it at a faster tempo. example of what we've been talking about with the 16th note feel is the tune What Is Hip. It's become kind of a signature tune with the band. Uh, its original concept was derived from the drummer at the time, David Garibaldi. He had this idea for droning on one note. Uh, and at the time, I remember thinking, ah, this is not going to work. Um, but as it turned out, it turned out to be very hip, <laughs> and uh, I enjoy playing it. You'll notice when I'm playing this line that I'll be playing more than just the root. I'll be playing octaves and adding the minor seventh and other intervals, but we'll get into that later. Thank you. 
There's another tune that we do called uh, Only So Much Oil on the Ground, where the 16th pattern is uh, used and the approach with the right hand is very similar. It's got uh, more changes, uh, basically is the only difference, and uh, the thing is to keep the constant 16th thing going. Oh, 
both these tunes unique is the fact that I play every note in the bar. Each 16th note is clearly heard. Now when I approach a tune, especially if it's an up-tempo tune, I don't necessarily play every note, but it is what I feel. Just a constant Sixteenth kind of flow under under everything, and uh, as far as what gets hit and what doesn't get hit depends on the uh, the arrangement and the other uh, instruments that are being used. Depending on the groove, I can pick and choose whatever note I want to hear. Let's start with some ghosted sixteenth notes, and I'll just. Press down when I want to hear a note. A good example of this technique is the line I use at the end of what is hip. Now you notice I'm setting up a 16th feel with my right hand and I'm picking and choosing the notes I want to hear with my left hand. Now let's try it with a metronome. You'll notice that I keep my left hand basically in this position no matter where I am on the neck. And the reason I do this is because basically it's the way I learned how to play and it's the way I've always approached the instrument. What it enables me to do is to get the percussive and muting sound that I'm looking for. And I basically play off of this finger I will play off of this finger, and I will play this one at times, but almost everything is played off of this finger with these two fingers giving me the muted sound for whichever note I might be playing on the neck. Uh, as opposed to, maybe not the same line, but close. But as opposed to moving my fingers like that is... And that's the way I approach just about everything I do. One of the other things I accomplish by keeping my hand in this position is like going from one to four, A to D, D to G, G to C, is I don't lift my finger to go from one to four. I just, I'll just rock back and forth. It may be difficult to see that I'm doing that sometimes because there's very little movement in my left hand. So what we're going to do is the ride out to what is hip again. Let's try something similar with the rhythm section. The chords will be from E sus to E. I'll start off real basic on the root and 
we're working to a tune that we do called A Little Knowledge is a Dangerous Thing. And it incorporates the muting and the 60s note feel that we've been talking about. Here it is. A lot of bass lines you play will involve octaves, and that means skipping the string with your right hand. You need to get comfortable with this motion of alternating from the E to the D and the A to the G. For me, I rest my thumb on the pickup when I'm going from the E to the D. And then when I move to the A to the G, I rest my thumb on the, on the E string. But you should do whatever is comfortable. That's what's comfortable for me. Here's something you can practice that will help you with your coordination with your octaves. Let's take the same octave exercise and start from the high note and come down. Now let's take the same thing with 16th notes and start from the low to the high. Try that at a faster tempo. Let's try that at a faster tempo. 
Let's do the same thing we did before. We'll start from the high note and go to the low. There's this tune we used to do called On the Serious Side, and it shows exactly the approach in using the high to low octave as a lead. I'm going to play it really slow, and then we'll do it up to tempo. And here it is up to tempo. In addition to octaves, uh, I also play a lot of fifths. Um, we can do the same exercises with fifths as we did with the octaves. Uh, let's try the first one. Let's do the same thing starting with the high note on top. Let's combine these two patterns at a faster tempo, starting from the low to the high on the way up and from the high to the low on the way down. This next example is based off the root, the fifth, and the octave. Uh, the changes are from D to C. Root, fifth, octave. Let's try it with a metronome. Now that we've taken a look at these different intervals, I'd like to go back to what is hip and show you how they're incorporated into the line. We'll start with 16ths in the right hand. And it moves into octaves. Then we go into intervals using the 7, 6, and chromatically. So it sounds like this. Another tune that uses the same idea is you got the fungifies. So the key of D, and it uses octaves, the minor seven, and chromatic, back to the one. We'll try it slow first with a metronome. Thank you. 
play that up to tempo. Active exercises earlier, you remember we did them both ways, leading from the low to the high and from the high to the low. Uh, I'd like to show you the effect you get when you lead with one or the other at a bass line uh, using a progression, a two chord progression, uh, A minor seventh to D7, uh, starting from the low to the high first. This time we'll start with the high note, and you'll see how it gives the line uh, uh, a different sense of balance. Let's mix the two ideas together, and this is what it'll sound like. Thank you. 
You might find it awkward changing from low high to high low midstream like we just did. That's because the right hand pattern is constantly changing. What works for me is to lead with the first finger when going from low to high, as opposed to leading with my second finger. It's slower and it's very awkward. The same thing applies uh, leading from the high to the low, except I lead with my second finger as opposed to my first finger. It's slower and it is, again, awkward. Uh, when you combine the two together, it's naturally very, very uncomfortable to switch between the two in the middle of a line. Uh, so you really have to focus on getting your hand in the correct position uh, in order to execute the two of them together. The best way to get comfortable with this is to practice going one direction at a time. Low, high, then high, low, until you get comfortable with it. Then you can try putting the two together. Let's take another look at it. In this next section, we're going to combine the ghosting techniques we talked about earlier with these octave patterns. We'll start with the octaves first. Now we'll add the ghosting notes. I use this a lot because the ghost notes give me a percussive attack to set up the next downbeat. The next example sounds like this. You can also leave with the ghost notes on top. And work it into a bass line like this. problems you might run into is the harmonics ringing on the fifth and seventh frets. A uh, way to control that is by using uh, block position like we talked about before, muting the strings with the third and fourth finger and moving your hand around when you're playing the line. And uh, let me show you what it looks like. Uh, 
let's go back to the D to C changes again. And I'll play along with the metronome and incorporate some of these techniques. Another common rhythm you'll hear is the triplet. In this next example, we'll try a 16th note triplet on the bottom, ghosted, with the octave on top. Let's try it. And you can do the same thing with fifths. Another way to get this triplet sound is to rake across the strings to the note that you want. This produces the same sound, it's just a different way to get there. Uh, now what I'm doing is ghosting two notes on the G and coming down to the D and then hitting the low D. Now let's try this with a metronome. The important thing to remember is that the triplets, the ghosted triplets, are actually part of the line, so they need to be heard. Let's try it again. I use this technique on a ballad we do called You're Still a Young Man. I'm going to start out real simple, slowly bring in the triplet rhythm so you can see how it all comes together. Hard and hand I was 
play shuffles, the basic feel is triplets as opposed to straight sixteenths. Let's try this raking triplet pattern on an up-tempo shuffle called This Time It's Real. I'll start real simple, just playing the roots and slowly bring in the triplet feel. another shuffle for you, what I call a funk shuffle. Uh, the changes are from F7 to B flat, and the line, the bass line that I eventually work into is from a tune called Credit.
you'll notice in all the examples of these tunes that I'm playing very simple at first and build into whatever groove that, that we were doing. There's two reasons for this. One is so you can see what I'm doing. And uh, the other one is, is a personal reason because that's the way I basically approach new tunes. Unless I have a very specific idea about something, I'll play that simple through the changes until something that the drummer's doing or the guitar player or the horn player or something in the tune tells me to do something different. But until then, I just kind of walk through the changes simple like that and try to keep an open mind. I should do a couple of tunes for you now where the simplest bass line I'm playing could work in the tune. What I like to try to do is, is get the most out of it without stepping on nobody's toes. Uh, the first tune I'd like to do is called How Could This Happen? The next tune I like to do is called So Very Hard To Go. When I play this tune with the band, I actually play it very simple. Um, what I'm going to do here is take it out a little bit and just see where I can go with it. Thank you. 
A lot of people ask me about working with drummers and for me the bottom line is that the bass and drums they they have to lock they set the foundation for the rest of the band to build off of um, a good example of how this works is uh, a tune that we do called soul soul vaccination and david garibaldi was a drummer at the time and he had this drum beat as only David could do <laughs> that was out someplace else and I had to figure out a way to fit in. Um, I'm not sure if I thought about how to fit in or somebody else had to show me but the point is that, that we kept the lines of communication always open and we worked really really well together and we got to the bottom line and we set that foundation and i think that's one of the most important things you can do is keep the lines of communication always open so let's take a look at this tune As far as you know, the drummer bass player relationship, I mean, I think that he is a unique sort of a talent, you know, and he has great ears, had a real great sense of what to do, and he has a real unusual way of hearing things, you know. But he can play with the drummer, I mean, without question. I remember there was like a, for a while, people wanted him to play the thumb style, Larry Graham, you know. Kind of, kind of playing, and uh, that wasn't where he was coming from. He wanted to do his own thing, which was, you know, rightfully so. I mean, he had his thing, which was really, really cool, just as cool as that. You know, and uh, but that's the only time I remember him having any problem with anything is when it was suggested to him that he do that. Thank you. 
I'd like to make a couple final points. The first one is, I think it's real important to strive to be as much of an individual player as possible. And the second is to, to take from other players and incorporate it into your style of playing, as opposed to copying other players. And that's about it. I, I hope you've got something out of this tape. And uh, thank you very much for watching. And I wish you all the best of luck.
it, baby. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, this is for you, Ma. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. <laughs> Hi, my name is Francis Rago Prestillo. I play with a group called Tower of Power. In this video, we're going to answer some questions that I'm frequently asked about my technique and the way I approach the instrument. First, I want to tell you just a little about me and some of my influences, and Sally walked down the street. <laughs> Wearing a red dress. Isn't that what, vo Isn't that what vocalists do? Yep. No, they go, get this done, this is the last speaking time. <laughs> Hi, my name is Francis Rocco Prestillo. I play with a group called Tower of Power. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's on. I'd like to play a couple of tunes for you now where the simplest bass line could work very well in the tune. Um, what I try to do is get the most out of it. Uh, just because it just is, because. Okay. <sighs> we need words. <laughs> oh, you didn't get that? You shouldn't get that, I'm sorry, man. This will be the first video in Braille. <laughs> That's you were getting all that. <laughs> I'd like to make one. <laughs> There's one final point I want to make. There's one final point that I I'd like to make a couple of... <laughs> no, come on, we're there, we're there, we're there, we're there. Really? Yeah, we're there, we're there, we're there. Before it gets to that, before it gets to that. There's one final point I'd like to make, and that is creating your own identity. There are many musicians out there, as you well know, if, if you're trying to be one or if you are one. And uh, individuality is very important. And it's important that you steal and incorporate. This has been my philosophy for a long time. Steal, incorporate. Don't play anything necessarily to like somebody played it but take what you heard and incorporate it into what's inside you and how you feel and create your own identity and those are the kind of people that do that the, the kind of people that do that they they're recognized for that um, the other people are just as talented and in every way probably but they're more of that that uh, that big glob of 
people of musicians. Uh, it's getting pretty wordy here at this point, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was over a little while ago. The <laughs> <laughs> glob. <laughs> Careful, I had to get a little too technical. The <laughs> <laughs> glob. <laughs> oh, Welcome to the Rucklebush Theater Comedy Hour. Oh man, that was good. <laughs>